Harlem 1930s, let's find out what the Grimes are doing on that rock pile today. Did you throw rocks as a kid? Come on, Una, you threw rocks. I skipped rocks in the water all the time, sir. Oh, just on the water? Like, we threw them at each other. Oh my gosh, really? That's a thing? Yeah. I thought that was just made up. (laughs) Oh, no, no. And we played stick wars, too, where you take a big stick and you'd hit it against a tree and try to break it in half and fling it from the other side of the tree to hit your opponent. (laughs) The things we did in the rural areas. (laughs) I had a really sheltered life. I think the most we did is this, like, you know, those like little cinder blocks, like that stop your car in a parking lot. The most yeah. we do is like stand on that and play king of like the cinder block and try and push the other person off. Like that's as uh, you're as a I city got. boy. I'm, 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 I'm good. Country <laughs> people. <laughs> All right. So in this story, we have parents, Elizabeth and Gabriel raising their children, John, Roy, Delilah and Paul. Right. And they're in a vacant lot in the city. So these are, Closer to the the things that I understand, but they throw rocks, which is more what you understand. And there's this large rock formation in the neighborhood that boys like to play on. However, the grime children are forbidden from playing on it. Okay, seems straight. Till one day, Roy and John are sitting there watching the kids play in the rock pile. And Roy becomes a little bit too interested in wanting to head down and play on the rock pile as well. So while his mother, Elizabeth, is out at Sister McCandless, and again, she could just poke her head out that window to catch him, he decides, all right, cover for me, John. I'm going down. I'm going to go play on that rock pile. Don't you, don't you tattle on me, none. So he, <laughs> he heads out there. John keeps his mouth shut. And then when a gang fight breaks out, Roy gets a cut under his eye and runs screaming to his mother. Sister McCandless kind of helps clean him off and realizes the wound, oh, it's just a flesh wound. Nothing big. And they scold John for not being the older brother he ought to and keeping his younger siblings out of trouble. Now, when Gabriel gets home, we learn that John is the only child to be born to a different father. And Gabriel tries to take his anger out on John. But Elizabeth tries to take blame for the situation and step in. And eventually she kind of grabs her daughter out of the out of uh, the hands and Gabriel's eyes soften when he sees his daughter. And uh, John appears to be safe from a beating today, at least in story. Man, so mad at Roy. Oh, the brotherly love there is, though, it, it, it's there. It's there. I saw a little bit of myself with my sisters there with the why aren't you looking out for your younger brother? I was the youngest. My sisters were older. And I remember like watching sometimes they would get in trouble and I'm just like, they're not, I made the decision to go. They're not to blame here. Like I saw a little bit of my family life in there where I saw my siblings taking blame for which they probably ought not to. So do you think this is not unique to like city life? This is not unique to, I think even 1930s, I don't think this is unique to America probably or race or anything. This feels very standard that parents seem to put some of those parental responsibilities on the older siblings. And I think this is kind of a human thing of, hey, if something were happened to me, you're going to be responsible for your, your, your siblings, your, your younger siblings. And I just I don't think that's a fair thing to put on the pressure of those kids. And that's just makes me so mad at the parents and at Roy, because he knows that's going to happen to John, because this doesn't sound like it's the first time. Well, it's kind of like, where do you set up those guardrails, right? Like, yes, the the older child ought to be somewhat more responsible on a whole, right? Like every child's different, different maturity levels. I get that. But theoretically they ought to be more responsible, but can they be there every second of every day? It's just not possible. There, there's still some personal accountability that needs to come into the picture. And I think that's kind of one of the main thrusts of this story that I saw is that personal accountability and where, Everyone thought it ought to be with John being like, hey, that's probably not a good idea, Roy. Like, could he have stopped him? Could he have told, you know, if he went and told, would then that, you know, fracture the relationship between the brothers? It's it's very complex. This is not a straightforward situation. And I guess that's kind of where Baldwin excels is creating these complex human situations that we somehow have created with each other. I guess then there's kind of two main themes or importance is to the story of the family dynamic and the fear of the father coming in and 
taking out retribution for what happens to his son, to his adopted son, or looking at what is the, the, the cause of all this is not John's fault, not really Roy's fault. It's the fascination with the rock pile. Yeah. Well, I guess that fear. Where does that fear come from in this story? Because it's very prevalent, to your point. You had those neighborhood stories about the child that, that drowned. You had John was very feel, fearful of Gabriel's vengeance, of his fury. And then there's even the exaggerated stories about like the rock pile being created to like hold the subway down or something. I don't know. It was, really, it was very exaggerated, the point of the rock pile. But um, I guess that's a good place to start is, is what does this rock pile symbolize in these these children's lives in this neighborhood? I think it's the forbidden fruit maybe a mm. little bit religiously um, Christian symbol here of temptation. This is something that is there. You're not allowed to have it. And we're testing you to see if you have the strength to deny your uh, uh, worldly passions to, to save your soul, so to speak. I think that's actually a really brilliant point and way of phrasing that because you, to your point, the, the parents who are the, representations of higher authority in this level of, of God, if you will, to Adam and Eve of, of don't eat the fruit. Don't go to the rock pile. That's, that's your command, right? And whether we view Eve slash Roy as the one that kind of like went and Adam didn't stop Eve or, or, or John didn't stop Roy in this situation, we have temptation entering and we weren't able to stop someone from going to that. It's actually a really, really good way of putting it. And even to that point, you'll notice all of the names like Delilah and Paul and John, like those are all biblical names, but I don't think Roy is. And Roy is the one that enters into sin in a sense. He's the one that breaks the covenant and goes into the forbidden fruit, to your point, to this rock pile. So I don't know if it's, if it's disobedience. I don't know if it's lack of testing punishment grounds of some sort, but either way, Roy goes to those grounds and does he pass the test? I guess is the first question. I, I don't think he does. And if we think about Roy as being the one that is, that is testing um, the, the confines of quote religion here or his parents, uh, he's kind of following in that footsteps of the, the other boy that, that passes away, Richard. I don't think either is a biblical name. Um, so he, he's tempting that, that figure of his father. Uh, and even when he does break the rules, what happens? He's forgiven. His father forgives him. Uh, and he has that, that loving, caring mother and that they're going to take care of him because it's his son. And he takes out his ag aggressions on somebody else that's not, quote, his biological son, who is uh, John. Right, right. John's kind of like, I don't think you, if it happened earlier and I missed it, I apologize, but I don't think I realized John wasn't biologically Gabriel's until much later. And it's at that point in time, I feel like I needed to kind of recontextualize what was, what was happening in the story. And I'm trying to imagine like what was Baldwin trying to communicate. And one of the things I was trying to think about was, does John kind of view himself as the embodiment of sin? Is that why he's so fearful of Gabriel and the fury of, of, of authority of God of punishment? Is that, is that why he had all this shame and these, these feelings of not wanting to stand out because every time he stands out, what happens? Gabriel takes out his fury on John. John's the one that receives wrath intended or not half the time that no wonder he didn't go tell his mom that Roy went out. No wonder he tries to be invisible almost in these situations because every time he stands out, he's the one that gets punished because he's the one, like you said, that isn't biologically his son. And it's a very complex, as you said at the very beginning, because you're talking all about John, right? Because he's the one that does nothing, but who takes action? And maybe we don't know, but again, I didn't figure it out till the very end either that John was not his biological son. But once you do know that Roy is, and would Roy do this knowing that he might receive a lesser punishment because mm -hmm. his dad mm -hmm. is going to take it out on his brother? 
uh, if he knows that he's favored, you would use that manipulation. I think this kid is smart. Enough. Kids are smart enough to do that, right? I'm sure eventually, once, you don't have to admit it on, on the Codex Cantina because your sisters might watch, but I'm sure little Una used that manipulation because he knew he could get away with it and his sisters would take the blunt of the blame, right? <laughs> All right, I'm going, I'm going full honesty here. All right, I never <laughs> wanted my sisters to get into deep trouble. But more than that, I didn't want to get in trouble. So I would do things. I, I would do things knowing I could get away with more. And I, why did I know that? Because my sisters told me that. They would tell me all the time, oh, you get away with that. But mom and dad would never let me get away with that. And so perhaps I learned to test things further knowing that my leniency, where justice, you know, from what my parents could deliver would kick in. Maybe I got away with more. As a result, that I took advantage of that, but I don't think that justified or or pushed me to take advantage of my sisters per se, right? But in in this story, okay, let's 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 look at it from Gabriel's point of view because he's kind of like Fury. That's again a very biblical name when we when we look at it from uh, you know the writing perspective here. When he found out what happened, right, he was ready to just take the strap to John, which is which is sad. And what happened was his wife challenged him, right? And we have that line, and she found in his face no fury alone, which would not have surprised her, but hatred so deep as to become insupportable in its lack of personality. I think that was very eye-opening for what Gabriel's fury was in terms of his hatred so deep that it lacked personality. The way that he would take it out on John, and it wasn't personal. It was this punishment for sin that John has been paying for his whole life, perhaps. And I think was the hardest to read, for me at least. And really, it's hard to read, right? Because it's not John's sin. It's mm, probably his yeah, mother's yeah. sin. Right. right. That, that's the complexity of this, again, is that it's Gabriel being mad at his wife, but can't take it out on her because she may have had John out of wedlock, uh, you know, divorce was very rare back then. Uh, and he's, he's taking on, quote, the burden of not his son when he has three of his own children now. Man, that that's tough. It, it is very complex and it, it's very hard to read because is is Gabriel wrong? I mean, he's the archangel of, of like vengeance here. Is, <laughs> is he doing wrong? I mean, he is if he's going to beat the child, but he is taking care of a child that technically is not his. Well, and then when we say child, which child do you refer to, right? Because I think you're referring to John. John. Yeah, John. But it's at this point, Elizabeth also brings in um, Delilah into her arms. And he's yeah, the, the reverend, right? He's the reverend. He's the father. He is not challenged. He's the leader of the community, the leader both spiritually, leader in terms of this family. So when he's challenged, it's you know instant fury that we see. But what humbles him is when he sees his daughter being swallowed by his wife. And, and that's when we see the, you know, his eyes changed. He looked at Elizabeth, right? And he sees her as help me. Do, do you know what that term means? No, I don't think I've heard that term. That sounds pretty archaic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it depends on the translation that you have too, oh. of course. Um, we're going to go to Genesis 2.18, right? In terms of the Bible. And we've got a Hebrew term from the phrase, Help meet for him. Then I'll put the words up on the screen, but it literally means like a helper suited to, worthy of, or corresponding to him. So this is when God is creating Eve, right? Someone okay. who is worthy, quote unquote, of being a helper to him, right? Corresponding to him. Like that's what the wife is supposed to be, is someone that can challenge him and can rise up to that challenge of being like, look, I'm going to help guide you in this situation. I'm going to provide a different perspective, right? Because the biblical man's supposed to be the leader, right? He's supposed to be the reverend that this that Mr. Grimes is, Gabriel is. And I think he sees his Eve. He sees his help me and his wife. And that's what spares John this time, at least. And this time. And that's what breaks my heart is there should never be a next time. But... Obviously, Baldwin, I think, is giving this idea that fi family dynamics are complex and you never know maybe the true nature of someone and that maybe we all have sin and the, the sins of the father, the sins of the mother will be passed on to the next generation. Well, it's hard, too, because 
I mean, doesn't the father kind of have to know what he's doing is wrong? What he's doing is taking out his anger on what his wife did to him years ago. And he's never going to let John or his wife live that down. So, so it's not just, hey, it's not okay to hit the child, right? Like, well, that's step one. But step two is, how do we deal with these, these human emotions that you're having, these insecurity issues that you're having about your wife? Because that's really at the core the problem, and it's not addressed in this story, which is what's hard. So you're going to, as a reader, I think, worry what's going to happen to John next time, and how is John going to escape this? When he does look at his daughter, they talk about the the rabbits and they talk about the barking dogs and some things that are more rural in nature. I almost got a sense that John, uh, no, I almost got a sense that Gabriel is maybe city boy, urban life, and that Elizabeth is maybe from the south. Maybe she's from a rural area. She came up to the city with her, you know, baby boy and, and met Gabriel and they, they had a family together and that it's a different ideology of how you raise your children or how you are to, to discipline your children. Maybe, I mean, there, there's a little bit in there of that, maybe just a, a different way of thinking of, of how to raise a family. Oh, interesting. I didn't pick up on that. I'd love to go back and kind of relook at it with that lens to say, is there commentary about it from that perspective? Interesting. I hadn't thought about that one. Yeah. A little rural versus urban ideologies. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll say this. This was definitely, I'll say the conversation that we've had, I think was, was very impactful. I think it was very valuable to have this conversation as opposed to just reading it by myself. So first of all, thank you (laughs) for having this conversation. (laughs) Thank you, sir. (laughs) I, I think sometimes that's, that's interesting is how we can unlock these views and these feelings and discussions through discussion beyond just reading. And, um, you know, just a little reflection on the channel that I think that that's something that has helped me grow as a person and as a reader too. Good job, James Baldwin. Good job, Crypto. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to leave the Baldwin playlist down below. You know what that is? That's where you go to see our other talks on Baldwin because we think he's one of the greatest writers that have ever happened. So if you want to see our talks, please go do that. We have, we've enjoyed every story that we've read by him. So we post videos every Monday and Thursday. My name has been Una. Peace out. Crypto out.